All right, this evening, uh, we're, I've already told you what we're going to be looking at, so let's begin by reading a passage of Scripture, James chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 17. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, but our primary focus uh, is going to be on verses 2 through 4. And really, since this is more of a topical study than, than an, a, um, I guess, an exegetical study, uh, this is really only going to be part of it. What we're going to do at the beginning is kind of work our way up to this. Okay, so let's begin by reading the text. This is what James writes, beginning in verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too, the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Hmm. Well, let's go ahead and, and stop there. wanted to read further into the passage so we could see about you know, what James had to say further about trials. Now, just as a reminder this morning, we saw the, law, the Lord's sovereignty in, in our salvation, that we did not choose Him, that we never would have chosen Him in our condition, but rather He chose us in eternity past, before we were born, like uh, Jacob and Esau, and had done anything good or bad. He chose to place us in Jesus, to adopt us, and to make us the heirs of His kingdom. And we also saw why he did this. It wasn't because of us. He did it purely out of his love because it was his pleasure to do so. And he did it that he might show, uh, basically us, that he might show his angels and that he might show the world uh, his grace, the glory of his grace and mercy so that he might receive the praise for these things. Now, this evening, I want us to consider, as I've already said, that his sovereignty extends beyond uh, simply the election of who it is he's going to have mercy on, who it is he's going to leave in their sins. Now, I know that we usually approach this from the opposite position. We talk about the sovereignty of God over all things, and then we zero in on this. But certainly, if the Lord is sovereign in uh, what we, I don't know if we call this a small thing, that he has had mercy upon us. Uh, he is certainly sovereign in the greater things. But the Bible tells us he is sovereign over all. He has absolute control over everything. Whatever happens in this world is essentially a part of the plan that he is working out, including the things that happen in our lives. It's all a plan, part of his plan, 
for our good, even the difficult things that we have to face. Now, Paul told us this morning that God is in control of our final destination. He predestined us to adoption as children. He made us the, the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. But as I've already said, he is in control of much more than that. Let's read again what Paul had to say this morning in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 11. He says, Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now notice that God says here that he has a purpose, or Paul tells us through the Spirit he has a purpose, that God is working this purpose out. It includes basically all things. Everything that is being done in the world, everything that happens is being worked out according to this plan. He is in absolute control of everything. All things here means everything, whatever exists. Whatever happens in the world, God is in absolute control of it. Now, R.C. Sproul said this one time, and I believe it is, it is true. He said that God certainly must have control over everything, or he isn't really in control of anything. And he mentioned the fact that even if there were a molecule, just one molecule, what he calls the maverick molecule, that he doesn't have absolute sovereignty over, that he couldn't predict what was going to happen with it, couldn't somehow control it, that molecule could feasibly ruin uh, God's plans. And it's been said uh, before by uh, probably philosophers and maybe those who think about time travel. If you were to go back in time and move a grain of sand, you could alter the course of history. And I think there's also what's called uh, uh, the butterfly effect. If you were to go back in time and step on a butterfly, it might also uh, change history. God must be in control of all things if he wants to ensure that what he wants to take place will actually take place. Now, if that is true of things as small as molecules, how much more true is it of the greater things taking place in the world? The Bible tells us, God tells us in his word, that he is, in fact, in control of the big things. He is the one who controls nature. Jesus tells us that he is the one who sends his son, that is, the sun that shines. Uh, he is the one who sends the rain, who causes the food to grow. That he does this for us, and he also does it for those who don't know him, because the Lord is kind, because the Lord is good. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, verses 44 through 45, But I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God is in control of the sun. God is in control of the rain. He is sovereign over these things. He may give these things out of his mercies, as the psalmist writes in, in Psalm, let's see, I think that's 107, verses 35 and 37. He changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city and sow fields and plant vineyards and gather a fruitful harvest. Paul actually refers to God's kindness and mercy that he displays toward all men as evidence that God exists. But God is good and he is good to all. He may grant these mercies or he may take them away as he sees fit as an act of judgment. We read in that same psalm in verses 33 to 34. He changes rivers into a wilderness and springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. So the Lord brings drought if he desires in order to judge the wicked who are in that land. Certainly, if the Lord is in control of things that we would call the ordinary weather patterns, uh, he's certainly in control of those which are much more severe. Let's not forget the flood in Noah's day was no accident. It was an act of God's judgment against the worlds. And we read in Genesis 6.3, 
Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. God is in control of great things like judgments, great and severe weather patterns. But let's remember that when the Lord did this, it was also his way of preserving his own people. Then the Lord said to Noah in chapter 7, verse 1, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. When the Lord brought this judgment, uh, one thing that um, one of my professors in seminary pointed out is that the world was, was quickly reaching what he would call the Antichrist stage, where the world was coming to an end. There was but one righteous man left, one family on earth in which there was the true worship of God. And if the Lord had not destroyed the world at that time, it would have stuffed out his church. So he did this as an act of judgment upon the wicked, but he did it as an act to preserve his people so that he might continue his work of redemption uh, through, through them. The Lord is in control of the big things. He is the one who controls the hurricanes. He's the one who controls the tornadoes, the tidal waves, the tsunami. He works all things after the counsel of his will. He controls the volcanoes. I don't know, we saw a YouTube video recently of a volcano erupting in Hawaii as the lava is just kind of slowly mowing through and burning up everything in its path. That's not outside of God's control. Uh, he is the one who is in control of when and where these things will strike, as well as how much damage they cause. These things are not accidents. These are not things that are happening outside of the control of God. The Lord is also in control of disease. God sometimes inflicts it as a judgment upon the wicked. But he often protects the righteous uh, from that disease if it works together for our good. The psalmist writes in Psalm 91, verses 7 through 10, a very comforting psalm. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, for you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. Uh, oftentimes, disease is an act of judgment. Let's not forget what, what the Lord says or what Paul says about the Lord's work in Romans chapter 1. That the wrath of God is being revealed every day from heaven against the wickedness of men. Many of the things that we see happening, which the world considers to be natural catastrophes, is nothing other than the Lord basically bringing judgment upon the wicked. Now, oftentimes the righteous will suffer along with the wicked, but not as the wicked, because as we're going to see in a few moments, the righteous know that the Lord is going to work those things together for their good. Now, the Lord is also in control of history. He is the one who raises up one nation and puts down another. Let's not forget what we saw this morning in our meditation in Daniel chapter 4 as Nebuchadnezzar was boasting about how he had built Babylon. The Lord reminded him by humbling him that it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar who did that. The Lord was the one who raised him up and gave him this glory and this power and he ought to glorify the God of heaven for doing that because he is the one who is in control. The Lord says through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 18 verses 7 through 10, at one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. You know, think about Nineveh. Or at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build it up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. The Lord raises up nations. The Lord puts down nations. Let's not forget how this nation came about, how there were those in the old world, so to speak, that were seeking a place for freedom of religion. And they came over here and they established churches and the true religion was established and the Lord blessed and prospered this nation. But now we've come a long ways. We've fallen a long ways from that. The Lord plants nations. The Lord can just as easily uproot and destroy nations. 
And He will do that if we do not turn away from our sin. So we need to pray that the Lord would do that. Now, something, one thing that might be perhaps um, not as familiar to us is the fact that the Lord is even in control of the evil that is going on in this world. I know oftentimes the Lord is represented as one who, uh, you know, he, he allows the evil to exist, but he's kind of separate from it. He kind of wishes it wasn't there, you know, so to speak, and he, he may work it together for good in people's lives, but he's not really seen as the one who has worked it into his plan and who is using it for his purposes. But as a matter of fact, God is in control also of evil. Now, James told us that he isn't the one who is the author of evil. We don't believe that he created evil. We believe evil came from his creatures and not from him. But we also know that God could put it out of existence. God could do away with all evil overnight. But he doesn't do that because it is his will that evil exists. And the reason why he allows it to exist is because of the good that he brings out of that evil. I mean, think about some examples from Scripture. How the Lord used the hatred and the envy of Joseph's brothers to save them, actually, from the famine. Remember, they hated him because the father or their father was showing him favor. And they took him and they took the coat that his father had given to them and they took it off of him and they threw him into a pit and they were going to kill him. But then he was saved by the inter intercession of one of his brothers. They decided to sell him to Midianite traders that were going into Egypt. And, and then the Midianites took him and sold him as a slave into Egypt. And then he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. And there he interpreted the butler and the baker's dreams and eventually Pharaoh's dream. And then he was raised up to second to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. And that is how he was put in the position to take care of his family. Now, his brother's sins became ultimately their deliverance. And yet, they were guilty of having sinned against God and having sinned against their brother. But this is exactly how God intended to use their sin. Joseph says to them towards uh, the end of, of his life, essentially, in Genesis 50, verse 20, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Again, notice, you meant it for evil. That was your intention. That was your motive. But God meant it for good. What do you mean God meant it for good? What, what did he have to do with their sin? God used it in his plan to bring about their deliverance that he might preserve his people from the famine that he was bringing on the land. He essentially wanted to move them into Egypt to make them grow into a great nation so that he might eventually bring them into the land when the, the sins of the people in that land had reached the point where the land was ready to spew them out and God was ready to bring judgment. This was meant to be a place to protect them until that time took place. God uses sin for good purposes. I mean, think about how he used the hatred, the sin, and the evil of the Jewish leaders and of the Romans to save his people and to save us from our sins by crucifying his son. When Peter and John were arrested for preaching the gospel and they were threatened and released and they went back and prayed with the disciples, this is what they said in Acts 4, verses 27 and 28. Speaking to the Lord, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. God used the greatest crime that was ever committed in the history of the world to save us. God uses evil for good. Do you know that God even uses Satan to do his will? You know, we think about Satan. He is an enemy. He is prowling about like a roaring lion. We do need to be on our guard against him. We do need to resist him. But we need to remember that Satan is on a chain. And Satan cannot do anything to us unless it's the Lord's will. Remember, when he wanted to attack Job, he had to come and ask God for permission. 
And if the Lord had not given him that permission, because God had put a hedge about Job, protecting him, if he hadn't put, as it were, a breach in that hedge, there's no way that Satan could have reached him. But the Lord did that in order that he might glorify his grace and ultimately bless Job, as we're going to see he also does in our lives. God works even evil according to the counsel of his will. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, perhaps you've already noticed, but in each of these cases, essentially, God uses this control that he has over all things for the good of his church. He does it for our good, essentially what Paul tells us in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is in control of all things, and he works all things together for our good. Now, he uses even the bad things for our good. He doesn't just give us good things and work those things together for our good, but the bad things. He works the natural evils we were talking about, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, uh, the fire, the disease, and those types of things. And he works the moral evils that we have to face, the sins of other people, our own sins. He works these things together for our good. This is what we call trial. A trial is not an easy situation. It usually doesn't mean a blessing given to us. It means there's some sort of difficulty that we have to face that often arises from natural or moral evil. And it's called a trial because the Lord brings them into our lives in order to try us, in order to put our faith on trial, to test us. Now, God doesn't test us because he needs to know what is, you know, what's going on in our hearts, what our condition is, how strong our faith is, because God knows everything. Rather, he does it to show us what our faith is like, whether what we have is real or genuine, whether we're really trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Peter wrote this to encourage his readers in the midst of their difficulties. And again, this is the meditation we read this evening already. He says, in this, in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, in this, that is, in God's protection, He's going to keep you all the way to the final day. Nothing's going to separate you from Him. In this, you greatly rejoice. Even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith, the testing of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is basically found to result in this praise when it is proven through this test to be genuine faith. Now, Jesus tells us in the parable of the sower that not everybody's going to pass this test. Not everybody who professes to be a true believer is going to pass through this test. Now, every true believer will, but not everybody who professes. There will be those who fail this particular test. Some are going to fail, he says, because it's not going to be worth the difficulty they have to face for following Jesus. That's what he means by the stony ground hearers in Matthew 13, verses 20 and 21. He says, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the world, read trial here, immediately he falls away. So the trial of affliction or persecution causes him to wither because he isn't truly rooted in the Lord. He has no depth. It's only superficial. I think we all know people who have gone through that, and I should mention it's usually the ones that seem to seem so promising. They just sort of skyrocket. They become, almost seems like super mature really quickly, but they are the ones who fall just as quickly. And Jesus, when he describes the stony ground soil, says essentially the same thing, that because the roots don't go down very deep, the plant sprouts up, looks really good, looks really promising, but all the growth is up here. There's no rooting down here. Now, Jesus says others are going to fail because they're not going to be willing to give up what they have to in order to follow him 
And that's what he means by the seed that's sown among the thorns. Verse 22 of Matthew 13. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. In other words, they love the world and they want the things of the world so much that they really don't give their hearts to the Lord and serve and follow him the way they should. It chokes it out. And there's no fruit that is then brought from that life. But those who are real believers, those who are represented by uh, the, the good soil, uh, the plants that produce 30, 60, 100 fold and so forth, they will persevere to the end because they are protected by the power of God for a salvation ready to be revealed. So the Lord sends trials to test the genuineness of our faith. He sends trials also to show us the strength of it, the condition of that faith, should it be real faith. Gold, as you know, is purified by heating it, putting it in a crucible and heating it up. And when you do that, the dross, the impurities that are in the gold rise to the surface and it can be skimmed off. Well, the Lord throws us into the crucible, the crucible of a trial. And when he does that, our dross and our corruption rises to the surface. You ever notice when things get tough that you don't feel quite as spiritual as you used to? It's because it's beginning to shake up that corruption that's inside your heart. And it rises to the surface so we can see it. Oh, I thought I was more mature than this, but I guess I'm really not after all. But the Lord wants us to see it so he can help us deal with it and get rid of it, put it to death. So a trial helps to purify our faith and get rid of the corruption that's in our hearts. And then a final reason the Lord sends trials in his sovereignty is to strengthen our faith, which essentially the burning off of the dross will do. But the way James puts it is just a little bit different. It produces endurance. He says in our text in James 1 verses 2 through 4, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. You know, I can't remember the, you know, that when, when we do face difficulties, when things get hot and that corruption begins to bubble up, is that how you respond to it? It's really the way we should be able to, though, because of what the Lord is going to do through it. Consider it all joy, my brethren. Oh, great, another trial uh, has come because of what the Lord is going to do. It's not pleasant, but the Lord works good out of it. Okay, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, think of this in terms of our Father who is in heaven exercising our faith. He's producing endurance. He's stretching it. He's putting it to the test to make it even stronger. Now, when we exercise, you know, think about it in terms of exercising with weights, we need to increase the resistance gradually if we want to grow stronger. You know, you come up to the machine, you put the pin in one place, you know, and you do so many exercises or reps with it and so forth, and then the next time you need to move the pin down another plate when it gets easy, otherwise you don't get any stronger. Well, the same thing is true with regard to faith, isn't it? The, the test, the, the resistance has to become stronger. Now, when we first come to Jesus, the trials we have to face, the resistance is relatively easy. And the reason is because our faith is still relatively weak. But as we grow stronger, the Lord loads more weight on the machine to develop our faith even further. Sometimes it seems like the Lord is putting us through a CrossFit routine. I don't know if you're familiar with CrossFit. But the whole purpose of it is to push you to the absolute limit. You've got to push it to the limit. And sometimes the Lord, perhaps most of the time, he pushes us to the limit because that's the only way that we can grow. We have to hit the wall as far as we can go before we're going to get any stronger. Now, have you ever wondered why it is that you're faced with the particular trials that you are faced with. The reason is because those are the areas, I, I'll, I'll venture to say that we're all faced with more than one trial, those are the areas that the Lord wants to strengthen 
And one thing we need to bear in mind is that He will likely continue those trials until you become strong in those particular areas. When a trial comes, we usually pray, Lord, remove this trial from me. But what happens is the Lord leaves it there until we learn the lesson that we need to learn, and then He removes it. So it's meant to produce endurance. It's meant to strengthen us in the areas that we need to become strong so that we might better serve the Lord. He's preparing us for what it is that is ahead of us. So trials the Lord brings sovereignly prove our faith, purify our faith, and strengthen our faith. Just consider Joseph and Job, how they were changed for the better because of the trials that the Lord put them under. You know, it's been said that when a believer is put in the crucible and he is ground, as it were, uh, this, in this case, not the fire, but just the, the what do you call it, the, the pestle or whatever, just grinds away, that it creates a pleasing aroma to God. Whenever a Christian is put on trial, it produces this pleasing aroma. But it may not seem like that when we're under the trial because of all the dross and the impurities that are coming out first. Perhaps at first it isn't quite such a sweet-smelling aroma, but eventually it arrives there when the dross is burned away and only the gold remains. Now that isn't going to be perfected until we reach heaven, but this process of trial is a way by which the Lord is continually at work in our lives to make us more like Jesus and to purify our faith. So this evening, let's be encouraged that the Lord is in control. And because He is in control, we know that He is the one who is sending the trials that we all have to face. Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the Lord is going to work them together for our good. So the Lord not only loves us from all eternity and has chosen us to bring us to glory, he is also at work through all the circumstances in our lives, through all the things that He brings into our lives to prepare us for glory. Let's be thankful that God loves us enough to do that. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord to um, help us receive what it is He's told us through this passage.